Number 1. Shopping I usually do all of my heavy shopping on Monday morning. My husband goes off to work, and the kids are off to school. So, I can get the hardest part of my week over with right away. Then I can get meals and such. Well, this one particular Monday, my husband asked me if he could use my car instead of his own. I was a bit confused as to why he would want to do this. He told me he had a muscle strain in his right wrist, and it would be easier on him driving an automatic. So, I relented, although I really hated his car. It was a luxury car, yeah. And it seems weird to not want to drive a luxury car. But I just hated it, it was so big. Other than just being a pain in the butt to drive in general, the car was also aggravating. It was very back heavy. I kept feeling like I'd end up doing a wheelie at some point. To try and even things out, I put all of my grocery and other shopping bags into the front passenger seat and the back seat. That seemed to help a little bit. I'm not really sure what it was about the car, but from the moment I stepped into it, I just felt completely uncomfortable. A part of it was me feeling small as I wasn't a very big woman. But I guess it also had to do with my driving a stick shift, something I wasn't used to doing either. But the worst part of driving it was something that I couldn't even begin to explain why it was bothering me. I just felt like there was some negative air surrounding this car, inside and out. I made sure that I would tell my husband that I would not be willing to drive his car again. I remembered that I had to go to the furniture store and pick up a new desk for my son. He had began taking college prep classes, and I felt he needed a good place to do all of his work, rather than on the kitchen table. While I was talking to the salesman, I got a call on my cell phone. I silenced it, and told myself I would call the caller back later. The salesman helped me with my desk, loaded it onto a cart and brought it out to my car. While we were walking out, my phone began to ring again. This time, I decided to answer it. And when I took it out of my purse, I saw that it was coming from my husband's job. It was his boss, Kurt. He asked me if my husband was sick, and I told him no. He then asked me why my husband had not been into work all day. I was confused. I told him he and I switched cars that morning, and I saw him. He was driving to work. I had let his boss know if something had happened to my husband. I was a little worried. I was concerned that my husband was in a car wreck or something like that. I hoped that wasn't the case, and just prayed that he had gone back home if he hadn't been feeling good. However, that didn't make much sense. I would have assumed he would have called in to work. The salesman asked me to open the trunk, so he could get the box with a desk into it. I did, and I immediately screamed. Lying in the trunk was the dead body of a woman, and by the looks of it, she hadn't been dead for long. The police were called, and I was arrested and questioned. I explained everything. And after hours, the police finally put two and two together and realized that my husband must have killed the woman who we discovered was a prostitute. He then hid her in his car, borrowed mine, and attempted to flee the country. He didn't get very far. He now sits in jail, and of course, he is no longer my husband. Number 2. Night Clown This isn't really a long story, but it is a really scary one. Do you recall about a year ago, when people were reporting all of those clown sightings? For the most part, I figured it was all just one of two things. 
it was either a really big hoax, or it was just a bunch of people trying to get attention. At no point did I ever think that there were actual clowns out there who were trying to hurt people. Well, the one night that changed my mind was in November of 2016. For the most part, the clown mania had already hit its peak, and it was beginning to recede. We heard a lot less on the news about it, but it hadn't completely gone away. We didn't think very much about it, because we're not scared of clowns. In fact, we had never quite understood the fear of clowns. We've always found them really funny. But I guess it is that non-fear of them that caused this to happen. Interestingly enough, we had been to the circus just a few days before, and my six-year-old son told me he wanted to be a clown when he grew up. I was completely okay with this, although I assumed it wouldn't be much of a lucrative line of work. Anyhow, I was sleeping with my wife. I can't tell you what it was, but something had woke me up. A noise or something. I was about to go back to sleep, when I once again heard the noise. This time, I knew what it was. It was like a honking sound. With sleepy eyes, I got up and decided to take a look out the window. I was surprised when I saw a clown standing on the lawn of my house. It must not have noticed me in the window because it was looking at the door of the house. It was then that I heard the unmistakable sound of my front door closing. Immediately afterward, I saw my six-year-old son trotting off the front porch and headed towards the clown, which was waving at him. Fear gripped me, and I acted completely on instinct. I went into my nightstand, unlocked it, grabbed my gun, and then ran downstairs and out the front door. My heart was jackhammering in my chest, and by the time I got off the front porch, the clown was holding my son's hand, and they were facing away from us. I told my son to come back over to me. Both he and the clown turned and looked at me. The moment the clown saw the gun, he let go of my son's hand. He took off running down the street, which led me to believe his intentions were not pure. Unfortunately, the event traumatized my son. Not the clown, but me confronting the clown with the gun. But what else could I have done? What kind of clown comes around at two in the morning and tries to lead a child away from his home? Luckily, the horn had woke me up. Number three. Where? This is the sort of thing you would never think could actually happen to you. In fact... This is the sort of thing you really only think happens in cheap, scary movies. But yeah, this happened to me about two years ago. I was having these weird dreams. And in the dreams, my body was uncomfortable and in a lot of pain. And my head was throbbing. And then suddenly, a burned serial killer with knives on his hands appeared in front of me. And no, I'm just kidding about that. My head was throbbing though, and I woke up and immediately began to panic because I couldn't see anything. I thought I was blind. I moved to get up and immediately hit my head on some sort of cover above me. It took me only a few moments to realize that I was in the trunk of someone's car. I wasn't tied up, but I had a bag over my head. I was already panicking, but this was now much worse. I felt that the car was driving, and wondered who'd put me in their car, and where they were taking me. I tried thinking back, and wondering exactly what had happened before all of this. And after a lot of thought, I finally remembered. This had everything to do with a guy I knew in high school. His name was Riley. 
He and I had always been at odds, as long as I could remember. He had recently got suspended from school for a month, for cheating on his midterm. Although he was caught directly by the teacher, Riley sat right beside me in class. He was sure that it was me that alerted the teacher he was cheating. I hadn't, of course. I hated the guy's guts, but the last thing I was was a snitch. I remember, after school, leaving after drama rehearsal, running into Riley, and that was the last thing I remembered before waking up in the trunk of the car. It was disturbing, but I guess that makes sense. Not really knowing where you are, not really knowing where you're going, and not really knowing what is going to happen to you when you get there are three of the scariest things anybody can think of. Each bump of the road will cause me to hit my head on the ceiling of the trunk. Finally, the car stopped, and the trunk was open. I was taken out of the trunk, but I couldn't see anything through the bag that was over my head. I was told to start walking, and someone from behind was pushing me in the direction I was going to go in. We went into a building, and I was tied down to a chair. I was terrified, absolutely terrified, and there was a large part of me that honestly believed that I was not going to make it through the night. These guys brought me here in order to kill me. I felt something put on my hand. It was on my fingertip. I think it was a set of pinchers. And immediately, I thought they were going to cut my fingertip off. I began shaking and wanting to plead with whomever this was to let me go. Suddenly, a voice spoke up. An unknown voice. Hey guys, we've already scared him. This is, this is going too far. We could get in serious trouble here. And get the hell out. The voice I recognized as Riley instructed. This stupid prick got me suspended from school. So I'm gonna take something from him. I felt the pinchers tighten on my finger. But then, I felt them loosen. I heard a struggle, which I later learned were Riley's friends pulling him off. I ain't going to jail for you, man, another voice said. I was willing to bring him here. Let's just leave him here and go. He won't rat on you again. Riley must have agreed. I heard several people leave. I don't know how long I was there tied to a chair, but it was a long time. I remember not being able to hold my bladder and peeing myself, which really sucked and really sucks admitting it to you. I struggled a lot to get out of the chair, but I couldn't. I was scared out of my mind. What if they left me somewhere I wouldn't be able to get out of? What if I died of dehydration? I was unfortunate that they had put me in an abandoned factory. I was fortunate that there was a caretaker for the area, who found me a day and a half after Riley and his buddies left me there. I was thankful to not have my finger clipped off, but I was not happy to have had this happen to me. Riley was arrested and sent to juvenile detention. Interestingly enough, this whole thing started because Riley thought I snitched on him for cheating. Riley, on the other hand, snitched on both of his friends, who I didn't know. So all three of them went to juvenile detention. What a hypocrite. And still, he kept his selfish demeanor up. It was my fault he got caught cheating. Although he was the one who cheated, it was my fault, and the fault of his two friends actually, that he was sent to juvenile detention, even though he committed the crime. Riley was the kind of self-entitled jerk who would never take any responsibility for anything, especially his own stupidity. Hey all, Killer Orange Cat here. I mentioned before in my last video, I'm not really a good artist myself, but I know a few of you are. I'm looking to put new channel art up on my channel's main page, 
If anyone would like to submit something, I'd really appreciate it. For now though, if you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, please hit the subscribe button below, or use the icon of Ichigo that will appear at the end of this video. Leave a comment to let me know what you thought, and consider sharing this video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have a story you like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please send it to the address included in the description. All I ask is that the story is original, meaning that it has not been read on any other YouTube channel. In the meantime, don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed, because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.